Hello folks, um, something a bit more serious this morning, doesn't hurt us to do that, does it? If you see the hair going, it's because I've got the fan on, because it's like an oven in here. <coughs> <coughs> Let's begin without further ado, um, context for this. The context is this, everybody's got to stop thinking that trans is Hayley Cropper. Everybody's got to stop thinking that trans is their nice friend who's a gender bender. Everybody's got to think that trans is just one thing. I've said it before, say it again, just so that you've got it. It's a collective noun, it's the same as a vegetable. We need to break down that collective noun and we need to do it regularly in our minds and we also need to do it publicly to ensure that we deal with it. Um, whether we like it or not, there is something in existence which Ray Blanchard called an AGP, an autogynophile, which is a man, and it very rarely a, a, a woman, which could be an autoandrophile, very rare, an autogynophile who has um, a paraphilia, not a fetish, a fetish is something that, you know, anybody can practice, a bit of a fetish, you know, smack, bang me on the butt with a woman's weekly, do it once a week in the bedroom, do what you want. Paraphilia consumes your life, okay? And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how a paraphilia affects women and children. And it's probably a good idea that you listen to the end. How my husband became a woman after 25 years of marriage. First she caught him wearing her knickers, then he changed his name to Charlize and started hormone treatment with no thought of the life-changing impact on her and their three children. I don't know when or even if my ex-husband was ever planning to tell me. In the event I found out by mistake when I discovered him at home wearing the red camisole and knickers from La Perla that he'd given me for Christmas. He thought I was out. Our three teenage children were downstairs watching a film together in the den. It was, of course, the most enormous shock. Time froze for a few seconds and I took in this surreal sight. Was that red lipstick he was wearing? To be fair, he was terribly embarrassed. We had been married for 25 years and together since our early 20s. Two years older than me, he seemed so together I loved him. We were a very happy, normal family. Or so it seemed to me, I thought I'd won the lottery of life. I didn't tell anyone what I had seen. I felt ashamed and embarrassed. We went to couples counselling and assured me that it was just a bit of cross-dressing. I knew he was a good person, that he loved me and the children, and I understood that he'd grown up in a very traditional middle-class family, where something like cross-dressing would have been totally unacceptable. I decided I could live with it. Yet deep down I must have known he wasn't telling me the whole truth, for one day when everyone was out, I went up to the, into the attic, which he always organised, for a look around. And there I found it. A suitcase I didn't recognise containing size 9 heels, fishnet tights, makeup up negligees and a long auburn wig. This is not about discrimination or transphobia, a term I'd never heard of when I discovered that suitcase 10 years ago. I've always been a huge advocate of compassion and support for people who wish to express or become the gender they feel they are inside. All I ask is that their families do not become collateral damage. The current revolution in all matters related to gender means more and more people in their 40s and 50s are admitting what was previously a secret, leaving wives and children to deal, often overnight, with a radically different version of the person they love. And yet all too often those wives and children are not affordable, compa for, afforded compassion and support themselves, but instead are cast aside or forgotten or even accused of bigotry. It's worth you noting here from me, not from uh, the individual writing, but it's worth you noting from me, in 2004 they knew this. In 2004 when they debated the JRA they knew this. It should never have been put into law. It was put into law to prevent same-sex marriage. It should never have been put into law. At all. And I think, reading this type of thing, the only option is to repeal the GRA. She continues. Today, people talk about trans widows and trans orphans. I want to tell my family's story because I know cases like ours are not uncommon, but are largely untold. At couples counselling, my husband continued to unplay, underplay it. He insisted he was not gay. He said cross-dressing was a reaction to a lack of regular sex in our marriage. Which, like many long-term relationships, had suffered a dip in intimacy. So it was partly my fault. 
Having seen him in my lingerie, I did, he really didn't want to have sex with him at all. I didn't know what he'd be thinking. Would he have rather been me? But he started to get angry at this, so I forced myself to keep the peace, gritted my teeth in bed, and resumed more regular sex. Looking back, I was desperately trying to keep things the same as they had always been. I'd have done anything not to break up the family. After six months of weekly counselling, he stopped attending, claiming he had been to see a hypnotherapist and was cured of the need to cross-dress, in part because we were more active in the bedroom. It was just a temporary midlife crisis, he claimed, and now we could go back to normal. He never said sorry. But again, I had my suspicions. Every time he worked late at the office or went on a business trip, I wondered what he was up to. One day, I could not resist the temptation to go through his wallet. I know that makes me look bad. But I found a membership card to a cheap hotel chain, plus a receipt from Topshop. I nearly wretched he was still cross-dressing, but he was doing it was he doing it alone or with someone else? Everything seemed to be a lie. By now, two years had passed. The children still didn't know. No one did. I moved into the spare room on the pretext that his snoring kept me awake, but the truth was I could no longer look him in the eye. It was clear the marriage was doomed, and eventually I plucked up the courage to tell him I wanted a divorce once the children were older. He agreed, but said he wanted an open marriage until then. Starting now, after initially denying it, he admitted, he admitted he'd been having sex with other people dressed as women. He had also been spending lots of money on trips, clothes and hotels using a separate bank account. This especially upset me. He worked in management consultancy and was theoretically on a good wage, but I had been paying a lot of bills on my part-time life coach wage, having, been, having given up my full-time career to look after the children. I had trusted him around money and thought he was saving it, but clearly not. We weren't broke, we had, but we had three children, one at private day school, one at the state sixth form college, and one who needed private tuition... <coughs> and one studying for a diploma. It wasn't cheap. I agreed to an open marriage if that meant he could delay divorcing, but a few months later the situation began to spiral. He stopped hiding evidence of cross-dressing. I began to find things around the house, nail polish that wasn't mine, size 18 women's clothes in his drawers, parcels addressed to him from Zara arriving on our doorstep. Then with no warning, he hired a lawyer and sued me for divorce on the grounds of unreasonable behaviour. The petition cited the breakdown in marital relations, my mood swings, brackets, I was perimenopausal, yes, but nothing like as bad as some, close brackets, plus my financial dependence and aspirational spending habits. This enraged me. I demanded he move out unless he wanted a vicious court fight on his hands. He began to rent a bedsit nearby, but in revenge stopped paying anything for the children, which meant I was left with the mortgage, school fees and all our expenses to find. Meanwhile, he gave work up work and went on benefits on the grounds of emotional distress. I also discovered from his mail, which I guiltily started opening now he had gone, that he had run up debts on credit card and had a PayPal account I knew nothing of, and that he had not paid into his pension since shortly after we were married. I found myself struggling to keep our heads above water, so I got myself another part-time job pulling pints in a local pub and put out our spare room on Airbnb. Children didn't like that. I increased my life coaching hours and worked six days a week, and the older children found themselves part-time jobs. I felt proud of their efforts, but also furious that his deceit and irresponsibility had put us in this position. In fact, the children were upset with me because they assumed I'd kicked out their father with little reason. They didn't know about his cross-dressing, and I still wanted to protect them from the truth. I think I was frightened to tell them. Not long after he left, I got a letter from the solicitors demanding that we sell the family home within six months and give him half the proceeds. I couldn't believe it. Two of the three children had exams coming up. Their home was their stability. I said I was happy to sell it and give him half, but not at the crucial point in their young lives. He would not listen. I had paid for half the house deposit and always paid my share of the mortgage, so I did not feel I was being unreasonable especially as I was now paying for everything else, my anger reached new heights. How dare he? My eldest child found and read the letter about selling the house, and soon after that, my middle daughter started self-harming, cutting herself on her thighs 
and upper arms. My young daughter wouldn't get out of bed for weeks. I thought she had chronic fatigue syndrome. By now my ex and I were only communicating through lawyers. Without telling me, having not seen them for months, he arranged to meet the children for a walk. He told them then he liked cross-dressing and was non-binary. They came home in complete shock. Later that night, the youngest burst into hysterical tears, not knowing if I knew the truth about her father. I had to summon all my strength to tell her that I did, that I was fine, and that I was there to support them. My daughter, who was self-harming, however, had a total meltdown and was sectioned in a general NHS mental ward. I was exhausted and devastated by it all. A court hearing was looming about the house, and I did not feel I could take much more. How could this man I have loved be so selfish and controlling? One day I felt so anxious I thought I was having a panic attack. I could not stop crying and my breathing was erratic and very shallow. I took a taxi to A&E where I broke down in the waiting room. They wanted to take me in for observation but I had one child on a ward upstairs and couldn't leave the others alone all night. Doctors prescribed beta blockers and diazepam to get me through the crisis and antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication to help me function longer term. It helped, and slowly we all began to come to terms with what had happened. Though my middle child remained in hospital, the self-harm stopped. I began, to look, I began to look outside the family for support. My parents were both gone, my, but my brother was a help and my girlfriends were brilliant. I didn't hear a word from my husband's family, which was very hurtful as we used to be so close. I presume they were still in the dark about his new life and believed I'd throw him out for some trivial reason. Then five years ago, I discovered from my GP, who assumed I knew, that my husband was getting NHS counselling, my ex-husband, sorry, was getting NHS counselling and hormone therapy in order to start transitioning to become a woman. In about a year, said the GP, he will be able to start the surgery process in London. I felt blindsided again and so anxious for the children. Your father growing breasts, having genital surgery. However comfortable you are with the concept of transitioning, it will be a hard to process. Once again, there was no reply to my inquiry via law or lawyers as to how we should handle this as a family. Instead, my ashen-faced daughters told me they received a round-robin email from their father. <sighs> Sent to his parents, uncle and two siblings, informing him that his pronouns were now she and her and that he had changed his name to Charlize. I wasn't included in the email. His parents travelled up from Dorset to see the children for lunch one weekend, but it was a disaster. They were as confused as the children and no one knew what to say. That was how I learned my husband had been interested in dressing up in girls' clothes, even when he was younger. They had turned a bly eye to it, and he certainly never breathed a word of it to me. He always says he was a young boy. My understanding now is that he would almost certainly have known from an early age that he was gender fluid. Did he think about this at the altar when he made our wedding vows? What was real about our marriage? Had our whole life been a lie? He lived in one of those South London suburbs where everyone knows each other, and I started getting funny looks in the street. The two youngest were being teased at school, even ostracised. It turned out that Charlie's was prolific on Facebook and was going around the neighbourhood in fishnets, tights, skimpy tops and heavy makeup. None of us would deny Charlie's her right to this freedom, but I wanted to scream, slow down. This is not just about you. Please let the children take stock and catch up. I felt sad too for Charlie's because I could see her rapidly losing any respect the children still had for her. Neighbours would say, I've seen her in a mini dress. What on earth? I hated the curiosity and pity. I paid for a family counselling session after the money I was earning from B&B &B and, via the lawyers, invited Charlie's to come along. The only response was a lawyer letter saying I was not to contact Charlie's for any reason other than the immediate divorce proceedings and the house sale and wasn't to contact her family. When did I become the bad person in all this? I reached out to a transgender charity for a counselling session for myself instead, but the counsellor, a trans woman, implies that the reason the children weren't dealing with it well was because of me. I left in tears of impotent rage. I realised I'd have to stay silent for fear of a backlash and being judged. It felt immensely isolating. And in all of that, we were grieving. The children for the loss of their father as they knew him, and I for my husband. I had really loved him. I know he loved me. Sometimes after the children were in bed, I would go to the basement, curl up into a ball and sob for hours. I, had st I am still utterly bemused by how my ex handled it. Some psychotherapists think that some people transitioning go into a state where they cannot think of anything other than the finally being able to be free. They've spent all their lives not being themselves, and when they do come out, they feel it's their time now. I get that, but with all the kindness in the world, it's still a huge challenge for children, your family, your life partner. Ten years later, we are emerging from it all. 
I fought and succeeded in staying in our home until the youngest turned 18. Thankfully, I'm in a new relationship and all three children are dating in a healthy way. Our trust, trust in love has not been irre irreparably damaged. Yet my children have lost a great deal too. Their father, their grandparents and their wider family on the father's side. It is all too awkward to confront. They do not see Charlie's at all because they cannot face it. It is too unsettling and hurtful. Charlie's his parents have lost three of their grandchildren. With hindsight, perhaps what is most interesting and infuriating to me is that both the transitioning person and the state seem to simply forget the family's existence in it all. The transitioning person has counselling and can go on benefits, receive surgical operations and hormones on the NHS, can be signed off work, but all I got with two of the three children being still under 18 was £48 a month from Universal Credit. Things could be so much easier if only more people, if more help was available to deal with everyone's fragility at a measured pace. I can only hope that the next generation will not have to go through this as ignored collateral damage. It's a powerful piece and just one of the many pieces that you can read if you look for trans widows' voices. Just one of the many pieces that you can read. I come to this with a, with a perspective as a gay man, obviously, because I am a gay man. I can tell you this much. This is a self-loathing homosexual. When he was younger, I'm sure he tried on clothes. What? Hello. Did it? Did it? Been there, done that. You know, used to dress up and do all the thing. Young boys don't have paraphilias. That would have been a per per perfectly natural part of his progression, possibly as either a gender non-conforming person or just simply a gay boy. I, he's sleeping with men dressed as women. He was gay from the start. He was gay from the start. He's lied to himself for so many years. Now he can't get out of it. He's a self-loathing homosexual. That's my take. Self-loathing homosexual. And when he continued what he did, when he did what he did, attached himself to this idea of this sensuous creature of the him, he perverted his psychology beyond belief and developed a very dangerous paraphilia, which has done the following to his wife. That's what it seems like to me. Transitioning is not something that doesn't harm. It harms many people, including society. Wear what you want, do what you want. Keep it in the bedroom when it's about sex. Right? Don't expect people to call you what you're not, and don't expect people to buy into your ridiculous belief system. I think he's a self-loathing homosexual. You can tell me what you think in the comments. Have a good one.